uh, good morning. Let us get started. So today, in today's class, we will learn the uh, concepts of continuous time Fourier series and continuous time Fourier transform. There is a distinction between Fourier series and Fourier transform and we will learn what the distinction is. As I said yesterday, any transform when you look at its application in the literature, you will find predominantly two different kinds of applications. One is the analysis which is used to understand what features a signal contains, right. So, and that typically involves breaking up the signal into the uh, so called building blocks or as we uh, will call atoms into the respective atoms that we imagine uh, that it is made up of and then asking how much of those atoms are and so on. There are different names to these atoms, they are sometimes called building blocks, they are sometimes called, they are sometimes called basis functions and so on. Uh, basically you have to understand them as some elementary uh, you can say constituents of the signal and the other application of the transform is in filtering which goes beyond analysis. So, you have analyzed the signal and you have decided what you want to retain and what you want to discard. So, in once you have broken up the signal you say well I do not want these components, I know a priori these are not of interest to me and I am only going to retain this and then going to recover the signal that is essentially filtering. We will predominantly look at analysis but also understand the filtering perspective and, uh, and it is uh, very useful. Now, before we proceed to the Fourier series and transform, it is uh, worthwhile talking about this concept of fixed versus adaptive basis. Just now I said the basic building blocks that is used that are used in a transform are called atoms or basis and so on. At this moment do not take the term basis in a linear algebra sense. We know what basis means in a linear algebra sense. If I say a set of functions constitutes a basis for some space, then they have to be linearly independent. That is a very important requirement. We are not really uh, strictly uh, speaking in a very strict sense here. The term basis should be interpreted as some building blocks. Now, what is this fixed versus adaptive basis business? Whenever I am breaking up a signal, I have two choices. I can break it up into known uh, basis in a sense known mathematical functions. For example, in Fourier analysis, I break up the signal into sines and cosines because that is what I imagine. Remember, the synthesis precedes analysis. So, I imagine that the signal has been synthesized from cosines and sines. Whoever generated that signal, whatever process generated that signal that I am analyzing, I am imagining it to be. I do not care really how it has been created how it has been synthesized, but as far as the Fourier uh, analysis is concerned, I imagine the signal to be made up of sines and cosines. Now, is that correct or wrong? We will quickly talk about it and there is nothing like correct or wrong, it depends on the application. On the other hand, I can imagine, uh, I do not have to pre-imagine the signal to be made up of something. I would rather figure that out by looking at the signal. That is. I look at the signal and say, ha, huh, maybe the signal is made up of this, this, this atoms. Like for example, uh, I take the wall, I do not know what it is made up of. I can, I have two choices. I can imagine always, does not matter whichever wall you show me in any palace, in any building, I always imagine it to be made up of a certain types of bricks which we call as a basis and that there is a mixing operation. <coughs> It does not matter to me even if you show me the most beautiful palace in Rajasthan anywhere, I always imagine it to be that way. No, obviously uh, it is common sense, it is not correct to imagine because walls need not be all uh, need not be always made up of bricks, they could be made up of other stones and so on. On the other hand, I look at the wall and figure out what is what it is made up of. Now, when it comes to walls or tables and physical objects, it is easier to figure out what it is made up of if I am allowed to really break it up physically. But when it comes to signals, it is very hard to figure out uh, what it is made up of. However, uh, that is what elements must have gone in making up the signal. However, there exist some uh, methods <coughs> to be able to adaptively determine what the signal is made up of. So, the difference between fixed and adaptive basis is in the fixed basis approach, 
I imagine the signal to be made up of always whatever I have in my bank, in my basis bank and there are certain advantages to it. Whereas in an adaptive basis approach, I do not have any predetermined basis bank with me. I will uh, adapt according to the basis. I mean it is more or less like a chameleon approach, but <coughs> it is useful. So, in the fixed basis approach, you have the Fourier family, you have the wavelet family and so on. Whereas, in the adaptive basis approach, you have uh, principal component analysis. For example, it figures out what is an appropriate basis for a given signal and there are many others. I am just Wigner really distribution is not really a transform. It basically looks at energy decomposition, but PCA is a very common tool. You must have heard of it. In uh, now. You should not think that adaptive basis is superior always to fixed basis and that the adaptive basis will always figure out correctly what the signal is made up of. There are merits and demerits to both these approaches. In the fixed basis approach, for example, Fourier analysis which is what we are going to focus on, as I said assumes that the signal, any signal you give to me, I will assume it is made up of sines and cosines, right. Now when is such an approach useful? Even if you take the Fourier family itself or the Fourier uh, basis itself. It is useful when for example, I am interested in detecting periodicities, right. Uh, I would like to know what frequencies are present or I would like to know what frequency content is present. On the other hand, if I want to know what frequency is present at what time, over what time interval, because there are many signals over which frequencies do not, the same frequency does not persist throughout. If you take changing colors of a flower, uh, you know, in the morning or you take the sunset, sunrise colors or any, many, even if you take speed signals, music signals and so on, if you were to examine the frequency content, they were to change with time. If somebody is speaking at a single frequency, there are many speakers who are capable of that, you are immediately put to sleep. You know, somehow that, that is how if a single frequency keeps hitting us at all, all the time, when, uh, so, if you speak like this for, for just 15, 20 minutes, that is it, you are put to sleep. There should be some modulation, there should be some variation in the frequencies and so on. And if that variation is pleasing, we call it as music, otherwise we call it as noise So or cacophony. Now, <coughs> in analyzing such signals, the Fourier family, uh, basis functions are not suited. Then you have to turn to another class of functions which are wavelets, for example where the basis functions themselves have that characteristics. If you look at the Fourier family, we have the sines and cosines as the atoms which, which persist forever. So they are suited for signals in which frequencies persist forever. Whereas uh, if you, so, some of you, uh, if you are familiar with the wavelet family, then the wavelet atoms are short lived, they are unlike your sines and cosines. By very, their very nature, they can capture short duration uh, events or limit, finite duration events. Again the wavelet family, uh, if you or the wavelet transform belongs to the fixed basis approach. In an adaptive basis approach, uh, there is one approach called empirical mode decomposition, it is also known as a hilbert huang transform. There in what people, uh, what uh, one does is breaks up the signal into its intrinsic functions, mode functions using some algorithm, we will not go into that. There you are adaptively figuring out what the signal is made up of, but there as well you have some assumption. Now the advantage with a with an adaptive basis is you do not pre-impose any uh, your own bias or your own prejudice and rather look at the signal and figure out what is present which makes a lot more sense. However, the difficulty is in analyzing the properties of the broken up components. If I follow the fixed basis approach, the advantage is I already know what the property of a sine or a cosine is. In, when I say property, I know what the frequency is exactly. I know if I plot the power spectrum, it looks like this and so on. So I, I know what the properties of the atoms are. The, mo, uh, the moment I break up the signal into its constituent atoms, if I see that certain atoms are present and certain are not, others are not, then I immediately say, yeah, you know, these are the frequencies present in the signal. It becomes very easy. In an adaptive basis, Although I have an advantage of adapting to the signal, the disadvantage is I, st I have to work on again figuring out what the properties of the broken up components are. This is only for your own uh, perspective and information, maybe some of you are carrying out research and signal analysis and so on. So you should see this 
broad classification uh, of uh, approaches in the transform world. The Fourier, Laplace, wavelets and all they all belong to the fixed basis approach and we will stick to that in this course. So, let us move on and now ask what is the general idea in Fourier analysis, be it continuous time signal or discrete time signal, the basic ideas remain the same, but the specifics of the signal synthesis and analysis change with the nature of the signal, whether you are looking at continuous time or discrete time and whether you are looking at a periodic signal or an aperiodic signal. And gradually as we talk of signals, we will also move to systems when the time comes, no signal exists without a system that is generating it. So, any inference I draw of a signal is more or less an inference that I am making of the system that is generating it. So, when I talked of energy of a signal yesterday or a power of a signal, one has to uh, go beyond the signal and look at the system. What do I mean by energy of a signal for instance? The energy of a signal has to be understood as the energy expended by the system in order to generate that signal, right? You say this guy is, has enormous energy, keeps speaking all the day, right? We do not say this guy is enormous power. So, how are you able to say that you are looking at a speed signal and you are saying, yeah, this has a lot of energy and based on the speed signal, you are drawing inferences about the speaker. Likewise, when we talk of energy or power of a signal, we are explicitly or implicitly alluding to the process that is generating it. So, that should be kept in mind if you want a suitable interpretation, okay. So, the general idea in Fourier analysis is to break down a signal into sines and cosines. Although Fourier started off this uh, with the idea of solving the uh, heat conduction equation in an easy way, gradually as we all know uh, Fourier analysis is more used today in analysis of signals measurements that you have and less in uh, solving uh, differential equations. Yes, there are a class of people who do that, but predominantly you see the Fourier analysis being used in data analysis or signal analysis. Now, this is similar to expressing a signal uh, as a combination of impulses. It is not that this idea was radically new, but there were some things which were radically new in terms of Fourier's claim that any periodic signal could be broken up into sines and cosines and so on. And it largely holds, the claim holds. Now, <clears throat> when you break up any signal into its atoms, typically you assume some mixing model. So, you are assuming that these atoms are mixed up in a particular fashion to pro, uh, make up the signal or to synthesize the signal. The purpose of signal analysis, at least in a fixed basis approach like this, is to figure out how much of each atom is present in the signal. So, these are called weights or coefficients, all right. And uh, they convey a lot of information about the signal as we shall learn. They can tell you when a particular feature began for example or how much a particular frequency is contributing to the overall energy or power and so on. And that is essentially your spectral analysis. And there is also this correlation perspective in a signal analysis, in a, in a signal transform, which is when we compute these weights as I just said or the mixing coefficients, you can think of these weights or coefficients as correlation between the signal and the atom that you have, right. If the correlation is very high, that is if the signal under uh, analysis matches very well with the atoms that you have, then uh, like a bulb it glows very high, uh, very brightly, otherwise it is going to be dim or even switched off. So, that tells you essentially how much of each atom is present. This is a qualitative but a very useful perspective. Sometimes you can quantitatively say that yes, indeed the weight is nothing but some kind of correlation. And uh, let us move on, some of these remarks I will actually visit uh, once we talk about the respective methods. So, the first in class is the continuous time Fourier series. Now, although I say this is continuous time Fourier series, I would like you to remember this in a different way. What we are looking at is analysis of or Fourier analysis of continuous time periodic signals. This is where the journey began and that is why historically I am just picking up this. Sometimes it may not be necessary to know the continuous time world, but it is good to begin with this so that certain terminologies and uh, jargon becomes clear. 
So, the idea here <coughs> in uh, the continuous time Fourier series expansion is that I take a continuous time periodic signal and imagine it to be made up of sines and cosines. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> now, as I say uh, sines and cosines, I do not have the sines and cosines explicitly in the expression that I have for the synthesis equation. So, what you see on the screen is the synthesis equation, right. It is called the Fourier series or series expansion of x of t and x of t is assumed to have a fundamental period t naught. This is a continuous time signal, therefore, the, the period of the signal is a real valued number and the fundamental frequency is 1 over t naught. You can think of f naught as 1 over t naught or t naught as 1 over f naught. And what we are doing in this series is expressing the period, uh, sorry, signal as a sum of all signals that have the same period, okay. So, if I, uh, if I take the fundamental frequency that is present here, in fact, when n equals 1 in the series expansion, that is where I have the fundamental frequency. When I move on to n equals 2, then I am including the first harmonic, which also has the same period. It may have the twice the frequency, it, it does have the twice the frequency <coughs> of the fundamental harmonic, but the period is the same. The only difference is for the first harmonic, the fundamental period is not T naught, but it is still periodic with the period T naught. So, it Intuitively, if you look at it, the signal has a period of t naught. So, it makes sense only to include atoms or building blocks that have the same period. If I include any other function in the, that is a function which has a different period in the expansion, then I will run into problem because that would not contribute. Uh, <coughs> that is the nature of the sines and cosines. So, that is a basic idea. You are expressing a periodic signal in terms of, as, as an addition of the fundamentals plus harmonics. Now, <coughs> there are two points to keep in mind. There is also n equals 0, which corresponds to the DC component of the signal. And if the average of the signal is 0, then the corresponding coefficient C naught would turn out to be 0. And secondly, what keeps bothering everyone is this negative frequency business. So, you see that in the summation, we have both negative frequency and positive uh, frequency. However, if you look at the original proposition that Fourier made, there was nothing like this. Fourier kept it a bit simpler, right. So, you have 2 pi n f naught t plus b n sin 2 pi n f naught t, right. n here running from 1 to infinity. So, in this expansion, this was the original expansion that was proposed, there is nothing like a negative frequency. So, where did the negative frequency come in when we wanted mathematical elegance and convenience and compactness and so on, where we said we will replace this cosines and sines uh, with the complex exponentials using Euler's formula. And that is when the notion of negative frequencies actually came in. Otherwise, you can see here if x is real valued, all the, your coefficients a's and b's are going to be real valued. There is no issue there, right. Whereas, in the Fourier series expansion that we see on the screen, which is also used uh, extensively, the coefficients c are complex valued in general. Now, it is hard to imagine a mixing coefficient being complex valued. What do you mean by I take a, I take a complex valued atom? First of all, imagining a complex valued atom itself is difficult and then to top it, you have a complex valued coefficient. But if you make it a practice, whenever you have this trouble in your mind, go back to this and say, yeah, it is only a mathematical artifact that, that makes these coefficients complex and the atoms complex valued, you should be okay, right. Therefore, negative frequencies come up only because you are replacing the cosine and sines with a complex valued. You are replacing real valued atoms with complex valued atoms. Naturally, you need, for example, if you replace cosine with the complex valued, you know from 
Euler's formula that cosine theta is e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta by 2. And that is how the story of negative frequencies begin. In certain textbooks you see that uh, positive frequencies correspond to clockwise motion and negative frequencies correspond to counterclockwise. I do not really subscribe to that and there is no base, there is no really uh, basis to believe all of that. There is just interpretations, retrofitting and so on. But the fact is you have negative frequencies coming in because of this. There are other explanations, but anyway let us not go into that. So, what you have to remember is that the coefficients of this exp expansion are in, uh, in general going to be complex value and the mag uh, therefore, uh, there is a magnitude and phase of these coefficients and we will soon talk about that. So, this is a synthesis equation. This is not going to be useful in practice for me. At least anyway, this entire continuous time case is not useful in practice. Let me tell you that. It is only useful for theoretical analysis or if you are given a signal x of t, you can actually perform a Fourier analysis. You cannot use it on data, let me tell you that. So, we will not spend too much time on this. Nevertheless, it is extremely useful in a lot of other applications. Sometime you must have seen this kind of uh, application used in summing up series. For example, if you are summing up infinite series, the Fourier, se uh, Fourier series expansion comes uh, very handy. Okay. Now, let us ask how these coefficients are calculated. It is not uh, sufficient and uh, to just say this is a synthesis equation without telling me how to, uh, without telling you how to compute the coefficients. Now, the coefficients are computed using an integral. So, notice that the synthesis equation has summation. Why does it have a summation? You have to be very clear in your mind because we are not including all the frequencies. We are only including in our bank, the bank of uh, atoms, we have only fundamentals and harmonics. So, the frequency axis is not a continuum whereas, the time axis is a continuum. So, that part you have to understand. If you were to plot here the time, right, this is your x of t. <coughs> here it is a continuous domain, but when I move to the frequency domain here, where the axis is now n, I will we'll, tell you what to plot here. But let us say you are, uh, you are plotting magnitude of Cn, does not matter, but the x axis is going to be now the index, the index of the atom that will help you keep track of which atom is present in or which set of atoms are present or basis functions are present in your signal. This n is an integer. So, here you are in discrete frequency domain, not discrete time. Whereas, the signal itself is in continuous time. But the signal is periodic. Very soon when we move to aperiodic signals, we will realize although the signal is continuous time, the frequency axis is also continuum. The main reason why the frequency axis is discrete is because the signal is periodic with some period and it makes sense only to include those uh, signs or complex exponent uh, complex signs which have the same period. Therefore, not all uh, frequencies are admitted only those specific ones and you have a discrete uh, uh, index or discrete frequency domain and that is why the subscript is also n for the coefficient. And now it explains also if you look at the uh, expression for the coefficients, you have an integral, right. This integral has come about because you are integrating x of t, uh, you are dealing with x of t, you are figuring out what that Cn is. How does one arrive at this expression? You might wonder, that is what is useful, but it is very straightforward. All you do is you go back to the synthesis equation and then multiply both sides with e to the minus j, right. Uh, 2 pi n f naught t. Notice that in the synthesis equation, I assume it is e to the j, whereas in the analysis equation, I have e to the minus j. Uh, there is a mistake there. I will correct it. it. It should have e to the minus j. Okay. I will make that correction. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, sorry, it, it does have uh, perfect. 
So, uh, in the analysis equation you have e to the minus j. How do you arrive at this equation? Multiply both sides of your Fourier series with e, e, with e to the minus j and use the so called orthogonality property of this complex exponentials. What we mean by orthogonality property is if you talk of in, in terms of inner products, the inner product between two complex sine waves is 0 if they are of different frequencies. If they are of identical frequencies, the value turns out to be 1. Okay? And the inner products for functions, continuous time functions are essentially defined in terms of integrals. So, you can see this derivation anywhere, but intuitively what turns out is I just have to multiply both sides with, with the conjugate of the atom and integrate. The moment I integrate, only one term remains on the right hand side which, corresponding, uh, which corresponds to the value of n. All the other terms uh, turn out to be 0. That is because of the orthogonality property of these atoms and that is a beautiful property of the Fourier uh, atoms. This orthogonality property makes life a lot easier in terms of calculations and interpretation and so on. I will tell you why the orthogonality property is useful in interpretation, but you can see in terms of calculation it is very straightforward. What I mean by calculation is calculation of Cn. All I have to do is multiply both sides with conjugates. I do not know if you are familiar with inner products of functions that do have inner products. If I look at, uh, if I were to evaluate inner products of two functions f1 and f2 <coughs> uh, with the appropriate limits, these are periodic functions let us say. So, I have here f1 of t times f2 star of t dt. This is called the inner product. Okay. What is f2 star? Conjugate, conjugate of f2. That is exactly what we are doing here. And these complex signs have the property that if f1 is uh, of a particular frequency, let us say n times f0 is one harmonic, and f2 is of a different is a different harmonic, then the integral works out to be 0. If they are if they are same, then it turns out to be 1. And that is why you see in this expression for Cn an inner product notation in the numerator normalized with the value of the inner product between e to the j 2 pi and f naught and uh, itself. So, you can therefore give it what is known as a projection perspective. I am not going to talk of projections, but projections in functional analysis in linear algebra uh, basically involves inner products. You are projecting essentially x of t on to the family of cosines and sines. Projection in a loose sense can be thought of and it is a very useful uh, perspective is nothing but a shadow. So, when I am when, when we are walking uh, outside on the road in the daylight or in bright moonlight, the entire 3D image actually is projected onto the two dimensional road and that is essentially a projection and what you what we call in daily language is a shadow mathematically it is a projection. Here you have x of t being made up of several sines and cosines in general and you are projecting x of t onto one of each of these atoms and asking how much of this atom is present and that projection is nothing but your inner product normalized inner product you can say so. So, to summarize we imagine in Fourier series expansion the periodic signal to be made up of fundamentals and uh, harmonics and the coefficients are calculated by evaluating this integral over one period. That integral t p would mean that I can choose any interval of period uh, t p or t naught. Okay. Uh, please understand that this t p is the same as uh, t naught. That is it. So, that is what your Fourier uh, synthesis and analysis is. 